tonight we are going to do a little different video. This is a follow-up to one, um, well, it's been a few years now, where we did a tour of the tying area. But tonight, after a two or three hour cleaning session, this area is as clean as it's been in a while. For sure cleaner than Cheech's station. In fact, at its dirtiest, it probably was still cleaner slash easier to find stuff, but it was kind of a mess. Anyway, I spent a lot of time cleaning stuff up, got rid of a whole bunch of things uh, that I don't need, and uh, I've got my chicken looking over my shoulder here, and then my dog, Gwen, come here. Yeah, get in there. Come here. Yeah, this is Gwen. Say hi. She is a sheep -a doodle and she keeps me company down here. She can also see herself in the monitor that I use to watch what I'm doing. Hey, baby. Who is that? Who is that? So anyway, tonight we're just going to take a tour of the tying area. I'll point out some things that I like as far as tools, uh, ways that I store things and organize things. There's no one right way to do this, of course, but uh, as I've been pretty OCD about some of my storage techniques and how I get to things and how I've got everything laid out. I'm going to go over those and give you some ideas of how you can uh, make your space fit what you have or what you have fit your space or whatever and uh, maybe give you some ideas. Okay, so we're going to start off just focusing on the most important thing of any tying setup and that is the vise or the area that you're going to use to actually tie your flies. So <clears throat> what I've got here is a Renzetti Master Vice. Um, my little base uh, is actually a C-clamp underneath. And then this is a tie wheel organizational uh, setup. And so this is the base wheel and it has a number of different doodads. You can see it's got uh, tool holes you can put things, spool, dowels, uh, more items in the back. And then the nice thing I like is you've got these little uh, <clears throat> pockets for beads and hooks or what have you. And then the plate itself has some magnetic pieces on there so that you can uh, put your hooks and whatever, keep things straight. So central to any tying area is going to be your vise and where you put the immediate things you're working with. So what you'll see here, I've got my tools organized so that I've got the bobbins. Um, I usually will have a pair of scissors or two or three pairs of scissors close at hand. You can see I've got a little tool caddy in the back there. Those would be more of my secondary tools. Um, not everybody's going to be a scissor whore like I am. Um, so you don't necessarily need to have as many fun dual doodads and bells and whistle to tools but um, I keep them fairly close at hand. One of the things that I like about, or, or what I was going for in my setup, as you can see, if we kind of pan around here, I've got my area is kind of like a control station. So I've basically got three Ikea, very inexpensive tables. The one here in the center is a corner unit. And as we wheel around to the other side, I've got uh, that one joined with a regular, uh, I don't even know what the dimensions are these with this table, but I, I think I got them at closeout at Ikea for like 20 bucks. So one of the central things to my tying uh, method here, or the organization, is to get plain Jane, not a fancy roll top kind of desk sort of situation. Because that way I can put whatever I want on it, I can organize things and I can change it. Okay, now <clears throat> the way I organize most of my materials is going to be in these really inexpensive Walmart or Amazon Rubbermaid style containers. One of my things is I like to have my materials because it's kind of dry here in Utah and it gets a lot of dust. I like to keep them inside of things so that they're not exposed to dust and cats and dogs. She doesn't grab too many things but she has been known to chew on flies. Anyway, so you'll notice that, like on this one, I've got uh, some hair. I have soft hackles. 
And so the way that I work with those is I have them in their bags and I put them in the drawer. And the nice thing is that I can close this drawer. I haven't ever had any problems with bugs, but again, we're not, we're in a pretty dry area. Um, <clears throat> this drawer right here is kind of my A-team hackle, dry fly hackle mostly, also tailing fibers. But I put these and they fit actually fairly nicely diagonally in these containers. A couple crees. Anyway, and those are the ones that I use for most of the time that I don't have to go digging through. So those are kind of the A-team players. But again, they go into a drawer. And then as you see here, I've got more items subdivided. And I have a fancy label maker right there. One of my must-have items for tying areas. Saves me a lot of time. I don't label everything. I probably should, but... Uh, you can see I've got a lot of things labeled. Um, speaking of ways to display and, and have your tying things, let me spend a couple minutes on pegboard. I went the pegboard route for a bit, and in theory, I think pegboard is nice. Everything's kind of right there at hand. The problem is, once you start to get a lot of a certain item, colors, sizes, that sort of thing, inevitably the thing you want is on the back of the peg. So you got to pull it all off, Take the one you want, whether you set those back on the peg or not, they may be sitting out. It leads, at least in my opinion, to a lot clutter a lot quicker. So, uh, I don't necessarily like pegboard. I like to put everything in self-contained drawer units like these guys. I've got foam. I've got more foam, wire. Now, let's spend a minute talking about beads and hooks. All right, for me, <clears throat> one of those things that becomes, that'll quickly kind of overwhelm your organizational area is going to be beads, hooks, and also dubbing, I think, uh, threads also. So <clears throat> one of the things that I like for beads and hooks are these Craftmate containers. And so what I'll do is I'll take my fancy label maker and label up some tags and put those, or labels, and put them on there. Notice also that on my beads, and this is a Cheech thing that I'm like, duh, why didn't I do that before? You'll notice that I've got them divided out by size, but all the colors are the same in there. Um, that's the nice thing is that if you were to do it by color, you'd have to pick them out by size, which would be tough. But I keep them all sub organized by size so that I can pick out the color I want and I'm good to go. So I've got my regular tungsten and this one that weighs like 10 pounds is, uh, or that was slotted. Here's regular tungsten. And then you can see back there in the back, we've got hooks and I label them by manufacturer. And it's kind of the same story here where I'll take the hooks and divide them up by style and size so that they're all nicely organized. And if I've got hooks that I may not be using frequently, I'll actually put them in the container up on the top. There's just a little uh, container there that I just throw odds and ends hooks. Okay, the next area is one that I don't have a great solution for, but I'm getting closer, and that is dubbing. So right now, uh, I'm a huge fan of these dubbingizer, the dubbing containers that keeps everything separate. Problem is, I've got probably, this is like a fraction of them, I've probably got 40 or 50. But um, what I am going to work on is taking another one of these Rubbermaid style containers and dividing it up for the dubbingizers and putting them into those, labeling them up, and kind of keeping them all organized. <clears throat> but for now, when I buy my dubbing, I usually buy all in the right color mix that I want, so basically the selections. And if I don't, I buy the blank containers, like these guys, and I fill them up with the dubbing, label them, and I'm good to go. So that's what we've done over here on some of these. Okay, one quick word on thread. What I used to do, even when I was a poor college student, is that every time I went to a fly shop, I bought a bobbin. And you can get the really good Griffin ceramic bobbins for like 15 bucks, 12 bucks, something like that. Not very much. And so I like to keep a lot of threads spooled all at once. And I've got a few more over here. This is kind of our filming area, but still, uh, I keep tools and bobbins threaded. So... 
I'm a big fan of not slowing down the tying process when you're in process. And one of those is keeping good, highly used threads at hand. So your blacks, reds, olives, grays, browns, uh, hot orange, maybe yellow or tan. But <clears throat> I like to keep them all, not all of them, but a lot of them spun up. Then any extras, I put in these containers. I don't like to keep them on dowels out in the open because they'll collect dust. And I've had it, especially when I've got these ones here where they're out in the open. If I haven't used them in a while, they will get a little dusty. And so you're going to be fighting with some dust. Not a huge deal, but if I can avoid it, I will. Okay, next item that's uh, worth talking about is my resin and adhesive container. So I basically, I don't even know where this tin thing came from, but <clears throat> anything that can spill or leak, I like to keep contained on the desk because as I've learned, if we were to come over here and look at this piece of foam is permanently affixed to this desk, thanks to Cheech, who spilled a big thing of super glue on it. Um, that probably would have happened anyways because this is our filming area. But if you can avoid it, try to keep those things in their own little container away from other things. And so that's where I keep all the resins and glues and coatings and that sort of thing. Keep them all separate, and uh, but still at hand. Okay, the next item of note, I, sometimes I don't even think about these because I just use them so much, is this hairline hook and bead pad. This is nice if you've got a table or a, you know, tying station kind of thing that you're using. Things, if you set on there, can potentially roll off. Flies can drop. Dogs can eat them. But uh, this hook and bead pad has little uh, divots in it so that if you set something on here, it's typically not going to roll away. So I usually keep one of those right beneath my tying area. And that also kind of brings up another point is I like to have as much horizontal surface as I can close to where I'm tying so that I can set things. I mean, this right here is super immaculate, but just give me a couple days and it's going to be covered with bags and packages of things. It's just nice to have everything right at hand, somewhat spread out, but not right on top of each other. So that's why I got this. This is a little table I got from Ikea. It's adjustable so it can go up and down. And when I'm not using it, if I need to, I can slide it back under the big table to keep it out of the way. But yet, uh, again, really within reach from my vice area, I've got all this space. Again, not as clean uh, as it... Tomorrow it won't be as clean as it is now, but most of it I can clear away for horizontal workspace that's, uh, that I can use at any time, all within reach. I don't have to get up and go grab something else. Okay, now let's talk about something that I think is super under appreciated and valued, and that is lighting. I'm kind of a light snob, and it's probably because my eyes are going bad, but I have usually at least two lights on my station. So we've got, and this serves a couple of purposes, I've got my light box for shooting photos right in there with three, four lights actually, and I have them hooked up to Alexa. Turn off the photo lights. Boom. Check this out. Alexa, turn off the tying lights. Oh boy. Now, that is some nerdy stuff. Alexa, turn on the tying lights. Alexa, turn on the photo lights. Magic, magic, magic. Anyway, uh, lights can be very beneficial to your eyes also for seeing what you're doing. So, like I said, I've, I've built this little jerry-rigged sort of lighting scenario. I've got a, an arm on the softbox, so that can actually swing over my tying area. It can also swing over here to the old filming area that we have. This is a ring light. You can get these on Amazon. You can get that on Amazon, Limo Studio. This is a new ear, knee wear. I don't know how you say it. Uh, lighting ring, get those on Amazon. And then I just hooked them up to these little swinging arms that are for photography equipment. I don't really know. 
And so that thing can go also back and forth down into the photo area. This can go from filming to tying to light box for taking pictures of flies. So granted, I've got an entire office here. Well, it's not that big of an office, but it's dedicated to tying flies, filming flies, and photographing flies. Um, but I like to have good lights. So for me, that's one of the first things you want to invest in is a decent lighting system for your setup. Okay, so that's about it. <clears throat> Hopefully I showed you some stuff that might be helpful to your tying area. Again, there's no right or wrong way to do the setup. People are going to want to do things a little differently. Dog is still staring at the monitor. Um, but you do what you can with what you have. Uh, I'll try to put links down in the description for <clears throat> any of the tool items and uh, little station items that I use. And like I mentioned, you can get a lot of these containers at Walmart or Amazon. Uh, there's nothing fly tying specific about them. They're more either craft oriented or organizational oriented. And uh, that should give you a start if you're looking at redoing or kind of changing your tying area or just upgrading a little. There's some ideas here hopefully you can use. That's it. We'll do another one one of these days of Cheech's area, so stay tuned for that.